Welcome to the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project. My name is Pastor Crespo, research librarian and archivist here at the Bronx County Historical Society. And I am joined by pioneering graffiti artist, Butch Two. Butch Two, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, hi, I'm Butch Two of the Fantastic Partners, graffiti writer dating back to maybe 1972 uh, to the current day. Uh, graph moving over to um, street art, visual arts. Glad to be here. Thank you, thank you. Today is Wednesday, April 12th, 2023, and we have the distinct honor of documenting an oral history for NAC 143. NAC, welcome. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm happy to be invited. And uh, my name is Kevin Santos, AKA NAC 143 or NAK 143, and they know me as the NAC Star Kid. And uh, I'm just a um, born and bred Bronx kid and just happy to share my story. All right, awesome, awesome. We like to start our oral histories out by asking about your family history and background mm -hmm. and where your parents are from. Uh, well, my parents, uh, my father's from Puerto Rico and my mother's from Puerto Rico. Okay. And they, they came here in the early part of the, uh, the century in the 1930s, no, 1940s and 50s. Great, great. Yeah. Did they uh, ever tell you any stories or about any of their memories of Puerto Rico before they came here to New York City? Um, yeah, they said, you know, it was, it was a beautiful island. And um, I guess that was during my mom came here because uh, things on the island were bad as far as making a living. And my uncle had joined the army and he served in World War II, one of our, uh, the greatest uh, generation. Mm. And uh, he actually joined as a teenager when he said he was 18 and he was only 17, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. And he started sending money back to my mom and my uh, grandmother, cause uh, she, my mom grew up without a father. Um, so basically, at that point, when my uncle finished and the uh, the war was over, my uh, they, my uncle decided to come to New York, and my mother and my grandmother followed him. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow. And do you still have family in Puerto Rico that you're in contact with, relatives? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of family in Puerto Rico. Yes, Santos, Rio Piedras, all over. You know. Great, great, and. When you when you uh, your parents first arrived in the Bronx, uh -huh. did they arrive in the Bronx? Where was it? What neighborhood? Um, I think I don't know exactly. My mother, I think she first arrived in Spanish Harlem, okay. and they were renting out a room or something. And um, as far as uh, my father goes, I couldn't really tell you. You know, um, that history is a little bit. You know, I haven't gotten that so many of those stories. You know, but uh, yeah, my mom was renting some room in uh, Spanish Harlem with my grandmother. And my grandmother was a seamstress. So she got a job as a seamstress here. Wow, wow. So what are your earliest memories of your neighborhood in the Bronx? And where's that at? Okay, so I grew up, uh, first, my earliest memory of the Bronx is probably Dyer Avenue, last stop on the five train. Mm -hmm. And I remember this is how I got enamored with the subway trains before I even knew I was enamored with the subway trains. Uh, my grandmother lived in the polo grounds. Okay. So we were going to go to grandma's house. So she took me and my brother down to the train station. It was like biggest day. And we got on the train and we went at, the, I guess it had to be in the, probably the early 70s, 71 or 69. And we took the train down Maybe at that point, the uh, the train was working where you could go to uh, the Polo Grounds with the, um, what's the L, the 3rd Avenue L? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I know there was some the connection Avenue, from researching right. it. And uh, next thing you know, we come out on the D train and we're in Manhattan. So when I first got on the train, it was sort of like, wow, this is, you know, sit up on the seat and look out the window. And then we go underground and then we got the D train and that train was uh, the CC's had the wicker chairs and the fan. So I was always like picking at the wicker chairs. So I was just like fascinated, like, wow. And then you come out and you walk up from underground and you're just like Manhattan, you know? So that's my first experience with like the trains and living in the Bronx. Wow. 
Wow. Now, living at home, were there any particular meals or favorite meals that you enjoyed at home? Favorite and meals. <laughs> <laughs> I was so skinny. I was a super picky. Like my father, uh, whenever we would go to McDonald's or Burger King or whatever, or White Castle, they'd have to order for me no, just the meat, no pickles, no ketchup, no lettuce, no nothing. And I know we would always end up driving back because they messed up my order and my father would be pissed off. So, but my favorite meal, I don't know, I'll probably, uh, you know, my grandmother made some wicked chicken wings, fried chicken wings it was and rice. It was just, the chicken wings were just to die for. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Now, what kind of music did your parents play at home that you grew up listening to? Yeah, so they was always playing salsa and, um, you know, they, they loved that type of music. Uh, they would go to, uh, we would go to house parties and visit family and everybody would be, you know, salsa dancing. I would just watch. And um, what happened was, um, speeding up to 1977, the hot summer of Summer of Sam and Summer of 77, it was so hot. So our house... My father was working for uh, New York City Housing Authority as a uh, you know maintenance guy. Mm -hmm. So he took us, came back in the afternoon in the summer and said, uh, come on, come with me back to the job. I'm going to go in and clock out. So we got in the car and when we were coming back, someone yelled, hey, your house is on fire. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, you know, I was probably like 12, 13 wow. years old. So basically what happened was the house didn't totally burn down. It got somewhat... Uh, burnt up and uh next thing you know we're living in a hotel uh, a motel over there on baychester uh fast forward to we take a trip to roseville island and somehow we you know i asked my mom how did we get to for roseville island and she goes well you guys picked it you guys fell in love with it so we saw we saw the uh, apartments it was like a new type of uh living because it was apartments we had i had grown up in a house really mm -hmm. and uh i was like Okay, you know, this will work. So that's my first uh, experience uh, moving to Manhattan, kind of Roosevelt Island. It was very isolated. And my parents were a member of the New York City Hispanic Society. And every weekend on a Friday, they had a Hispanic Society uh, club, kind of like a lounge. They had the pool table, the bar, and somebody was playing music. So uh, it turns out that. I got turntables for Christmas, and uh, after venturing off to uh, hearing the music in the park in Queensbridge, mm -hmm. uh, I got turntables and started playing the records and started buying records at Disco Man on 59th Street. So they said, hey, you guys could play some music for the Hispanic Society here on Friday. There was no money involved, mm -hmm. but, you know, maybe tips or whatever. Uh, so basically, we started DJing the parties where they were playing pool and playing cards and playing domino and we were playing the music and we were playing, you know, mostly salsa uh, because everybody was, you know, Puerto Rican and they wanted to hear the music that, mm -hmm. that you know, that they loved. So it wasn't about, even though at the time it was just disco at that time, uh, we did mix in a couple of records, but it was mostly like salsa that I was playing with and getting familiar with. Oh, wow. Wow. Now in your neighborhood, what, what games do you remember playing with the neighborhood kids growing up? Whew, games? Yes, sir. Every game in the world. Let's run through them. I thought, first of all, I thought I was going to be the first Puerto Rican goaltender for the New York Rangers because <laughs> we played roller hockey. Um, you know, it went from on your sneakers to get skates, and you had the metal skates, and next thing you know, we're out there running around shooting uh, electrical tape as a puck. So we played every game that was in the book, from hockey to uh, punch ball to stick ball, to uh, two-hand touch football, to uh, ace, king, queen, jack, to Johnny on the pony. I mean, wiffle ball was, uh, curve ball was also big too. Curve I don't know ball. if you, yeah, the curve ball was like you get a small D and you know how they got the little rise on the curb? Right. So basically one guy gets across the street and you have to try and hit the curb and try and make it pop over the head or make the guy miss it. So, you know, same thing, like kind of like stickball. Right. And that was curveball. That was a great game. And then there was also, of course, uh, hide and seek and manhunt. <laughs> manhunt. That's right. That's right. Manhunt. Yep. Now, growing up in your neighborhood as a youth, do you remember any gang activity in the neighborhood? No. See, so the North Bronx was like, 
it was sort of like suburbia, really. I didn't know anything about what was happening in the South Bronx at all. So there was no gang activity. There was uh, only uh, street teams like the Amundsen Animals. They were like our rivals. We had to go play them in hockey. My friend got uh, cross-checked into like the little uh, the house where they put all the, uh, the equipment or whatever, and he went through the door, and I was just like, oh, my God, it's getting serious out of here. That's when I knew I had to be a goalie. <laughs> Too dangerous skating around. Everybody wants to hit. Next thing you know, you're throwing, throwing down the gloves and fighting. So I was just like, I think I'll be a goalie. So uh, those are the only, like, gangs as far as it was just, like, rivals. We're going to play the Amundsen Animals in hockey. We're going to play these guys in football, you know. So that was basically my experience with any type of gangs. Okay. All right. And that wasn't really the gang. That was just, you know, fun stuff. <laughs> right, right. Now, r run us through the different schools that you went to from PS on up. And, oh, yeah. You know, uh, least, you know, some stories of each. So I grew up at uh, Monticello Avenue. It's like, basically, you get off at Dyer Avenue, you got a long walk up the hill to uh, Monticello Avenue. And um, then there's Seton Falls Park over here, which is a park that we used to go in and just run around and play like there was no tomorrow. It was just like adventure land, you know. Uh, I mean, it was just trees and bush and whatever. We'd just go out there and call it, go out there and go discover or whatever. It's just like in, uh, what's that, the uh, the, kid, the movie with the kids where they're uh, going out, walking around, and they find the dead body. Mm. Stand by me, is it? Stand by me? Yeah, yeah, okay. sort of like that. So we would get on the bikes and go out and venture, but uh, Monticello Avenue, the first school I went to there was PS68. And that's where I just grew up. Uh, since we had a big yard, I was always playing sports and running around, and uh, I was very fast, so I always used to love running. So at PS68, I was uh, known for running and for, uh, I guess we would play punch ball in the yard, in the, in the schoolyard in PS68. So, yeah, and then wiffle ball, of course. Um, after PS68, actually, at that time, they had a Catholic teachings where on Wednesday, you'd get on the bus and you go down to the Nativity School close to Dyer Avenue, which was only like five or six blocks away. Uh, we'd take the bus to uh, the Catholic school and we'd get Catholic training um, for like on a Wednesday. Religious instructions. Religious instructions. There you go. And uh, yeah, I would go on Sunday with my friends. We'd go to church. So, you know, one of my friends was an altar boy. So... Uh, since I grew up Catholic, I was just, you know, going through the, uh, okay, this is what I got to do, mm -hmm. you know. And um, from there, the school that everybody wanted to go to was Mount St. Michael, which was big reputation for sports, you know. Uh, I got to seventh grade at Mount St. Michael, and I thought I was just like, this is it. I'm on, had the uh, tryouts for the track team. I ended up my brother was a, a grade above me, so we had a final for the 100-yard dash, and I know that it was me, my brother, and his friend, and they were just, like, looking at me like, this guy's got nothing. I ended up beating both of them, and they were just like, wow, this guy's really fast. So basically at Mount St. Michael, they also had a Mount Sports Camp. I played basketball there. I played uh, – did we play hockey? I don't even think we played – I don't think we played hockey. We played basketball and uh, – all kinds of uh, sports, uh, track track and field, basically, running, high jump, you know. So, yeah, so that was my experience until 77 where we got uh, burnt out. And next thing you know, it's just like all the sports I grew up playing was just like, I guess I'm not going to go to Mount St. Michael anymore, you know, because that trip is a long trip. Mm -hmm. So I was in Roseville Island in the public school, and, uh, you know, it was cool. It was interesting. That was right. IS-217 on, on Roseville Island. Okay. Yeah. How was IS-217 on Roosevelt Island? Yeah, it was cool. You know, it was, it was good. It was a big mixture. It was a bunch of very, uh, it, it was a bunch of fun times, you know. All right. Yeah. Great, great. Now, at this point, do you remember the first time you saw graffiti? Was it on the train, in the school halls, staircase? Oh, yeah. The first time I saw graffiti was going back, way back. Uh, so my mother worked for the New York City Housing Authority. She worked for the house. She retired from the housing authority. And she worked 33 years since she was wow. like 18. Wow. And uh, yeah, so I think her last job there was she was uh, applications 
and uh, my first time taking taking the train alone, I got lost. I, I remember the train going over the bridge, and I was just like, this is not the way I'm supposed to be going, you know? So I ended up going to Brooklyn somehow, but uh, she was down by City Hall at 250 Broadway, and application was just like, all you see is a lot of people yelling, screaming, yo, when am I going to get my transfer? And when, can I, when, when is the apartment? You know, so... It was back then, it was the same as it is back now, I guess probably even worse. Mm. But uh, yeah, so that was my first experience with, uh, uh, you were asking me, what was the question? The first again? time you saw graffiti. Oh, the first time I saw graffiti. Uh, so my being that my mom worked in housing authority, she got my grandmother to an apartment at Boston Secor Houses. So that was on Baychester. So next thing you know, I didn't have to, I would go to stay in my grandmother's house with the Boston Sea Court and you look out the window, she was on the second floor, you see the train was laid up there on the weekend. Baychester. Baychester Avenue. And mm -hmm. I was amazed and I would look and I would look at the dirty trains with the writings and I would say to myself, that's how they do it. They just go up the hill there and they write their names on the train and then the train runs, you know. And I didn't know much about graffiti, but that's my first time experience. Like, wow, that's how they write their names on the train. Because underneath Baychester, there was always a bunch of tags underneath there, underneath the trestle. So I guess passing by there in the car, I would see it, but I would think nothing of it. Like, you know, see, you see the names, but that that's about it. I didn't put one and one together. Like, this is what I'm going to be doing like later on, you know. So yeah, that was my first experience. I was just like, wow, you know, if I would have known that. 12 years old, like the trains are there, I could hit them, but I had no idea about painting or anything like that. So yeah, that was my first experience really, seeing the trains and seeing graffiti. But it was more when I moved to Roosevelt Island where uh, the double R was the train where I'd see all the, ta all the tags on the insides and I was just like, oh, this is graffiti. And that's when uh, my friends who I met on the island, Days and Dak too, TFP, Mm -hmm. uh, they were going, Dak was going to music and art and Days was going to art and design. So they were artists and I was always drawing my uh, Spider-Man, Captain America, Marvel comic stuff. And they're like showing me the black books with all the art. And this is like, this is, this is what graffiti is. You know, you got to find a name and then you got to write it and make it as, make it look as cool as possible. So I was just like, wow, this is, I'm down for this, you know? So that's my first experience of like, the black books on Roosevelt Island and then the, the tagged up trains. And then when I said to myself, uh, riding the trains to my grandmother's house and seeing the trains, I was just like, oh, graffiti. I've, I've seen that before, you know? And basically I was hooked from there, you know? Wow. And you had mentioned you, you didn't take any art classes in school. No. Coming no, up at all. No. no influence there at all. No, I was just drawing comic book, like comic Marvel comics. The covers were just like so juicy with the mm -hmm. colors, so I was just like, "Wow, look at this cover!" You know, I gotta so this this gotta be a dope issue. So basically, the Marvel comics in the '70s, the covers were just incredible with uh, you know all the artists. So basically, I was trying to draw a little and do my own little superheroes, and there was nothing about lettering at that time until I got to Rumpel Island, which was '77 to '78, '78 to '79. Okay. And that's when I really started to develop a name. My first name was Bull, based on my zodiac sign Taurus. But I didn't really kind of, I didn't really like it. And I started writing two names because people had two names. And then actually, people had the two name, two, uh, two win, uh, well, no, win two or two, two dark or two something. You know, the two names started to come come about. And they're like, yeah, you got to get it like a one name, and you got to get another name to write as well. So. Days was writing Try. He did a Try piece on the island. So I was just like, I'm going to write Mac, you know? Uh, I, and then I looked it up in the dictionary. And it said K-M-A-C-K. I can write it N-A-C. I can write N-A-K. You know, I don't have to write K-N-A-C-K. So basically, that's when I started writing Mac and then Bull. And then I left the Bull alone. I just went with Mac. Oh, wow. Because I thought it was a clever way to do something. N-A-C, N-A-K, you know? Wow, so I was gonna I was gonna ask you when you first became a writer, but you, you uh, just stated that. So tell us about your early years in graffiti. 
Yeah, the, er, the earliest memories is so I'm on Roosevelt Island, and I can't say what was it the winter probably was the winter whatever but I would basically my first time riding on the trains was I got on the train to go see my friends at Mount St. Michael in the springtime I figured it had to be like 78 mm -hmm. in the spring of 78 I got on the train to go see my friends on Roosevelt Island to see how they were doing since I had moved away and back then it was just like how do you contact people, you know? Call them on the phone. Like, I don't even remember if I had people's number. I know I would just went up there. Mm -hmm. And I started writing bull and knack tags on the train. And being such a toy that I was, I got ink all over my hands. And I was just like, got to see them. And I was just like ha hiding my hands in my pocket. I didn't want to see what, didn't tell them I was writing, you know, my name on the train or anything like that. So that was like my first time hitting the trains. And, uh, that was the first time really like getting like the, the fever for like, oh, look at that. You know, I put my name up and it's going to be running. Everyone's going to see it. So I thought, you know, but right. it was more to that. That's just the beginning. You know, it's just like you're a baby and you learn how to crawl. Right. Next thing you know, you're walking. Next thing you know, you're running. So that was my first experience was just tagging my name on the train. Probably was like 78 in the spring. But uh, my experience with Graf from there was was basically... I wanted to see how, what they were doing on the trains. Because everything was so, you just see it and it was gone. Mm -hmm. And Days was doing some incredible outlines. So I had no style. I was just like trying to put together letters and it was just bad. Uh, bubbly letters, whatever. But, you know, it was just basically it's like uh, anything else. You got to try, try and fail and hopefully you'll get good at it. So... He would give me a bunch of outlines that were like incredible and just, I would look at them and I'm just like, okay, I got to get some, some style, you know, get some writing style. And I figured the best way to do it would to be take my little camera and take pictures of the subways. Ooh. So I started kind of categor cataloging everything I did from my first piece on Roosevelt Island, which was on, uh, the uh, the generator house where the, for the for the tram mm -hmm. that faces the East River on the other side of the East River was the uh, the Pan Am heliport right where uh, Tony Montana picks up the phone and he makes that phone call so across the river you know was the the building and I was just like well no one's gonna see me doing this here so only uh, passing boats might see it but you know it's probably so small no one's gonna see it but I knew it was there. I took a picture of it. I have the picture from uh, April 28th, and there's the date on there, April 28, 1979. Um, that was my first experience painting. And then I did another piece on Roosevelt Island, which was the uh, the nurse's home, which was already, at that time, was abandoned. And the, tra the bus, when you get off on the tram, you get on the bus, and it would go around this turn, and you would see the nurse's residence. And when the it made the turn, you see, like, the... Uh, delivery ramp and there was a gate there and I did a, a knack piece right there and I'm just like everyone's gonna see that one you know because <laughs> basically it's all it's all about people got to see your name you know they got to yeah. see it somewhere so basically I had like the biggest impact I think as far as like oh my god somebody did something over there you know what's those letters so that was like my second piece and then from there basically it was like uh, we fast forwarded to I started taking some pictures of my stuff and I figured I got to take pictures of the trains. So I don't know if I went up to Rose to uh, Intervale Avenue where on Intervale Avenue you can run it was elevated you could run from one side to the other without having to pay your fare, you know, you could just easily cross over mm -hmm. and get the train. So basically I started taking pictures in 79. Uh, I don't know if I was when we moved out of Roosevelt Island, was I in the was I in the Bronx at that time? But uh, this is where a big thing happened for me as far as like a little known history that a lot of people don't know about. Some people know about uh, Henry Chalfant, who cataloged graffiti, uh, who came out with the subway uh, subway art book. Uh, 
you know, so I started taking all these pictures on Interville Avenue. And then one day I see this white guy there looking kind of nerdy and he's taking pictures just like me. And I'm just like, okay, well, he don't look like a cop. You mm -hmm. know, if I were to summarize what a cop looks like. So he came up to me and he's like, hey, do you do this stuff? You know, I don't know what the comment. And I was just like, yeah, you know, I write knack and I introduced myself. He's like, where do I find writers? Where can I find writers? And I said to him, I said, you got to go to, uh, you got to go to 104 Night Street and Gang Concourse to the bench. Oh, cool. That's the writer's bench. You go there in the back after three o'clock, you're going to find everybody you want. And that's basically how uh, I put into motion. I, I would say how started the ball rolling. I was like Henry's introduction to meeting other writers mm -hmm. and finding out what writers think and what they do and making his connection with the writers, even before the, uh, the break dancers, the B-boys. Right. Because uh, he put that first event together where it was a combination of the B-boys performing with, I guess, I think he was putting slides. He had pictures of his, uh, that he took of the graffiti. Uh, uh, I don't know if they were being, um, what do you call it, uh, projected on the wall or mm -hmm. he had photos. But I, I didn't go. It came out in the Village Voice. Um, and that was like sort of like the beginning. So we made like a friendship. I introduced him. Uh, I think I went down to Henry's studio with uh, Crash, who moving from Rosewood Island, where I knew Days and, and Dak, I met uh, Crash, lived on 146th Street in Batanza. So my father was uh, a maintenance man now at Batanza. Mm -hmm. That's how we got from the Bronx, from Rosewood Island to back to the Bronx which uh, at 13, I was just like, I had just gotten a sheepskin coat. And I was just like, the South Bronx, it's over. It's wild over there. You know, and basically I was like, uh, didn't know really anybody. But my father, one day I went to see my father and uh, I think Crash was on 146th Street. I think I met Crash. I don't remember how we met. Was it through him or was it through days or whatever? But my father was the kind of guy who knew everybody and was friendly with everybody. And they had the BLS squad, which was the Bad Latin squad, which from my projects. And they were kind of a gang. But uh, so, you know, there was cats that I knew from Crash hanging out with them. And uh, that's where he made that BLS gate. And mm -hmm. he made that Patanzas piece. So basically from there, I started getting my feet wet in graffiti. Uh, and going out and taking pictures more. And planning on the first train together that... It's going to be a piece, you know, on the train, which happened probably later on in the 79, in the fall. It was uh, me, Crash, Days, and Kel, since uh, Kel was Crash's partner at the time. So we did a, a knack and a Days, and Days did the character in the middle, and then Kel and Crash, and they did the, the gun in the middle of the train. It was We did that at Esplanade, and it was like, the rush was incredible. It was just like, wow. And, you know, and basically now we got to get pictures of it. <laughs> of course, Henry was doing his thing, taking the pictures. So I started developing this big photo album of pictures. And then after seeing Henry, where he was taking the pictures in, like I would take a picture of the whole car and try to get the whole car in or try and get the panel of the piece. I saw Henry was taking like shots of one, two and three i was just like oh he's putting together yeah. the train and like where you piece all the, the the negatives together and you're gonna have one whole train so i was like oh i'm gonna do my pictures just like that too so i started taking pictures like that so probably from 79 to 82 all the pictures you see that henry has i had two big photo albums full of those pictures and of course uh by the time we got to, uh, you know, train after doing, basically after doing one train, okay, the next mission is get more paint, do another train, and just, you know, go on from there. And that's how I basically got my feet wet in, in uh, the graph culture and uh, started just basically making a name for myself with um, Crash, Kel, the rock crew, rock stars, turned rock, rock on City turned into the rock stars. CYA was... Uh, crazy young artists, cool young artists. 
and uh, we did a bunch of trains and a bunch of missions. And uh, I didn't really think that, uh, you know, it was just fun stuff doing as a teenager. Mm -hmm. There was no thinking of the future. Like, we're going to, hey, why don't I take these pictures and go to a publishing and see if they want to make a book? Like, I didn't even think of that, you know. I didn't think that I, that would be possible, you know. Right, right. I want to back you up a little mm -hmm. to your very first tag uh -huh. and your work with markers. Were there any particular markers that you use, and did you make your own markers? Any particular style that you worked with markers? Spitting? Uh, what was that called? Spitting the marker? Spitting the marker? And well, making a drip? Uh, basically, so when you start out, you start out tagging. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing you do, your signature. Um, and the markers, they were saying that you got to get a pilot. And you got to take a, a, a pin and take the tip and sort of like make it all rough. So that way you're going to have a wider, nice, you know, soft look mm -hmm. as opposed to the straight edges look. So uh, at that time I was just like, okay. Uh, some people also were, you could just get an eraser, steal the eraser from the school. Skill eraser from the school, cut a piece of it off. I think you turn it upside down. You you get ink and you put ink in there. I don't really have so much experience with the ink, but I knew I had a marker. I got the eraser from the school, chopped it up, and made a uh, where the uh, the eraser was curved over and made like the craziest looking tip that was like you know once you hit it, it was just like. Beauty, you know, just dripping like crazy. That's the one probably that uh, I took up to the Bronx and got my hands all like basically flooded in my pocket because you don't know that, you know, the tip is sort of like you made your own tip. So you took out the other one and you didn't really, uh, you know, Sick. you're not, you're not, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Mr. Uh, fix it up where you got to just like, okay, let me make sure it's sealed so nothing drips out. Of course, you know dripped all over me and that's like, okay, this ink could be messy. But my experience with ink was sort of like, I want to put my name on the train on the insides first, but then after seeing the pieces and taking pictures, I was like, I really want to just do pieces. I want to put my name and do something nice on the train, like a comic, like a Marvel comic cover. And basically that was like my whole thinking. I was like, the insides are nice, writing your name, but I just wanted to do a piece on the train and go on from there. You know, no, uh, I want to go to the yards and tag up the insides. There was nothing like that in my head as far as just like, no, let's go piecing instead. Why are we going to do the insides, you know? Right, right. So which stations, tunnels, or yards were the ones that you went to the most? Can you talk to us about those? Yeah, first of all, the... Uh, the Esplanade, which is Morris Park, between Morris Park and Pelham Barkley. Pelham Barkley. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an underground tunnel that's got a lane in there where you could just walk in. And it was the first place, my first experience going to the tunnel. Uh, it's filthy in there. Yeah. It's dark, it's filthy. And then, you, you know, one thing you got to get used to is. <clears throat> the lighting, you know, you're in the piece of basically piecing in the dark, you know, you're right in front of the train. Uh, perspective is just like, you can lean back and do this and figure it out from there, you know. Yeah, that's it. So, uh, luckily, just like the masters had back in the day, you had someone who had experience and they'll help you, Days or Crash or Kel, they'll help you who have more experience than me. Oh, no, it needs to be, you need to fix this part over here or fix that part over there. And then you just go and you try and, you know, do your best. And uh, all I know is piecing with those guys, they never wanted to put out any sloppy work. They wanted to make everything look nice. So that's my, was my whole thinking. Like, I don't want to mess, I don't got time to go on the inside to write my name. I want to do something nice here on the mm -hmm. outside so everybody in the city can run and I can get a picture of it. Um, so that's, the Esplanade was my first experience. And then from there, on Gun Hill Road, on the two train, 
there was a layup underneath. There was a track underneath, which was part of knowing now that we have the internet reading back, that was part of uh, the Third Avenue L used to go up. I guess that's, uh, is that Webster Avenue? Yeah, I think it, it would go up Webster and then it would turn and come across mm. Gun Hill and that would be like the last stop where it would finish. So uh, during the 80s, that was basically on the weekends, they would, it was just a layup for the, the trains to be there on the weekends and it was like a track underneath the track and basically you have your train there where you could just walk in from this uh, from the gate there and then you know as you wait make your way up you could just walk in or pull it back or cut it or whatever it was already cut and that layup was really uh, a nice spot <laughs> you could hear the music from the T connection pumping you know because the T connection when the early hip hop started, uh, so basically we would be in there piecing, and that was like a, a fun spot to be. And that was my second spot, probably. My third spot was the one tunnel, which was between one thirty seventh and one forty fifth, and that was like uh, going to Pelham Bay and having a picnic with all your friends. That tunnel was huge, and there you could get in through the platform. And there was also a hatch up on the street. Uh, I think one time we went, we were in there for so long and there were so many people that we went from McDonald's. So <laughs> we went on a McDonald's run. And uh, I remember we went, we went out through uh, the hatch. And I remember I saw a case who I knew that he had, you know, he had the limp, but you know, later on I learned that he had only really had, he had a half leg and he had one arm. So I seen him climb the ladder with one arm, like nothing. And we went through the hatch just for the hell of it. And we went to McDonald's and we came back to the platform like we were going to get on the train and whatever. We just went back to the back of the platform and went back in the tunnels. And uh, that one tunnel was like a, you did everything in there. It was so long. And I think there was two, two lanes that were in there maybe. Might have been more than that. Uh, that was like a party yard. Yeah. I remember we brought so many people there that I brought my cousin from Spanish Harlem and my brother there, and they were hitting up the insides. And uh, I have a piece that I did with Days that he took a tag on there and said Stone One. That was uh, you know his tag that he was putting up. But uh, yeah, I had my brother and my cousin. I brought them to the tunnel. Well, one time we went and recruited a, a writer who had quit. Me and Days went to Brooklyn to recruit uh, Repel, and we told him about the one tunnel. I'm pretty sure he probably, since he was an early writer from the 70s and the mid-70s, he'd already been there. And he said, okay, I'm going to come back and go with you guys. And we took him to the one tunnel, and they did a nice bunch of trains. And my first introduction to Quick. Um, so they pulled off uh, the two days and the pain, and the days and the pain. And uh, I did a quick, did this humongous quick, and I did this tiny knack that was dripping like crazy. I think I had flat black Martin paint, and it was just a mess. And now I look at probably my worst train ever. When I look at the train, I'm just like super tiny. And Quick's car, his letters go from one side of the train to like the middle part of the, the car. And I'm just like, I got to do better next time. The next time I came and I did a, piece with days I did this huge knack that was like for you it came out so great in my mind that I didn't want to put any I put some shines on it but I didn't want to put anything else it looked so perfect I was just like I'll just leave it like that and that was one of my best trains I did after being like previous time making a mess of, of things but yeah the, the one tunnel was like a, a party yard and the other place that I went to was probably um so I lived on Brook Avenue on the 6th train. Okay. So they started in the wintertime. It's cold. They're going to put the trains in the track, the express track, for the whole weekend. Boom. My home station, the train is right there on the weekend. So basically, there was a bunch of missions going on there where it was me, Kel, Crash, Dak. Uh, I even took uh, one of my my, my uh, partners uh, was Fable from the Rocksteady crew. Mm -hmm. Uh I took him there and we did a, he had some, he went to art and design with my cousin. 
uh, Mr. Wiggles. Mr. Wiggles uh, from the Rocksteady crew. Right. Prior to that was the uh, the uh, Magnificent Force, was the um, Electric Company Dancers. So it was Electric Company Dancers. I was hanging out with Fable and my cousin, and we were doing the popping. We'd go to the front of the library in 42nd Street and dance for change or whatever. And, uh, you know, I was doing a little bit of DJing for parties, Sweet 16s, to doing the graph and doing the dancing and then going to school. So basically life was revolving around that. And the one time uh, I took Fable to the sixth tunnel there on Brook Avenue, it was freezing. It was like, had to be like 20 something degrees. But we pulled off a nice uh, Knack and Pazer car that uh, he had some really intricate outlines in the black book. And I told him, you can't do this on the train for your first piece. You got to simplify it. So I gave him, I did an outline for him. I thought, you do this, it's going to look dope. So we did a knack and a page that came off. And uh, I did a, it was a DAC 135 and a knack 143 I did there. And then I think me and Crash did a knack and a Crash uh, train. Uh, I think it was Baby Blues. We did a, a Kel... I think we did a Kell in the Knack with hot pink there as well. So Brook Avenue layup was like my favorite spot. But the spot that I went to that I've never been piecing before was uh, Brooklyn to New Lots, mm-hmm. New Lots Avenue. So somehow, some way, I did go to the sixth yard. A friend of mine called me up from Roosevelt Island. I don't remember how he got my number. Mm-hmm. And he said, yo, I'm going to the sixth, the sixth yard on Sunday with Scene. You want to go? I'm like, yeah, I want to go. We went to the six yard and it was like a Sunday afternoon. The sun was setting. It was probably like five, six o'clock in the summertime. And there was a hole in the fence and the train was right there. So it was a bunch of us. We went through, started my piece and school bus yellow. And I'm saying to myself, I see, you know, I was cataloging a lot of scene pieces on the six train. It was doing nice stuff. So I said, I had to do something nice. Next thing you know, I hear someone go, yo, yo. And I look down. And I see scene just turn the corner and then I turn around and I see like the cop car just pulls up right, right. The fence is there. The first lane is there. And I'm just like, Oh snap. So I just took off running and we ended up running into, uh, running out of there. I I followed scene and we ran to the uh, Lehman high school. I think it was across Westchester. So, uh, yeah, that was a, a crazy experience. Uh, but we're going back to Brooklyn. Somehow I got hooked up with, was going to do a piece with Kaz 207 from the rock stars and we were going to do a piece with Dondi and with Knock and I was just like oh snap these are the best writers out here Kaz Knock 167 Star Wars uh, Dondi you know it was like uh, I better bring my A game so mm-hmm. that day it was also I think it was a Sunday afternoon and the sun was setting and the the new lots was under construction at the time, so there was uh, they had a opening where you could just walk up this big dirt hill, and I was saying to myself, "That's it, we're just gonna walk in the t- in the yard like that." You know, we just walked. There was no you know s- secret entrance or anything. We just walked in like we worked there or whatever. So Donnie and Knock they did the Asia. Paris piece where Knock did the uh, the lady coming out the planet, the whole planet, and I did a Knack, and Kaz did a Kaz, and Kaz did some incredible characters, some incredible Baudet characters on that train, and that was like probably like my best experience as far as a thrill, besides going for the first time was painting with those legends, you know, wow. yeah, that train is uh, in uh, the Burners book by uh, Henry Chalfant, and it's also in the Star Wars DVD. But you, uh, the second DVD is just all the trains uh, called Destroy All Lines, and they have three of my trains in there that Henry took pictures of. Uh, that train is probably one of my probably my best train, one of my best trains ever. It's that uh, Knack and Kaz and the uh, the Asia and the Paris. You could see who, uh, which team won the battle in that train. Back. Okay, so I was asking. 
to share your memories about the yards or the tunnels that were the most difficult to mm -hmm. get in and out of and how did you overcome that? Uh -huh. um, basically, you had to be stealth, you know, and you had to go at a time where uh, it's going to be late and you're going to, uh, you know, somehow there were certain spots that you'd go to over and over because they were so easy, like the one tunnel, 137th Street, you get off at the station in the back, just walk into the tunnel, you know. Uh, Esplanade, which is another spot where you get off at the station, you just walk into the tunnel, you know, after the train leaves. Um, new Lots, that was my first one and only time going there. That was, uh, it, it, you know, it seemed like a walk in the park, New Lots. What other spots? The Brook Avenue, which is my station, I already know that, you know, there's never cops on the platform. There's no one going to be, you know, I, I don't remember anything being raided or, you know, anything happening there. Uh, I remember the Middletown's Rieger where the layup, the, 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 all the lights in the train went on. And next thing you know, as I grabbed my paint and I got a shock of electricity, we started running towards the platform. And all I remember was taking a misstep in the middle of the tracks, and I was just like falling backwards in slow motion, like, ah, and land, landed on my butt. Because you can't really fall through the tracks because they're so close together. So I landed on my butt, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> and that was probably like the only time that I really got chased out of uh, any, any type of spot or got raided. I, I don't remember ever having difficulty going to a spot and – being chased or you know except for that the six the six yard with scene and that zariga and that middletown road station but other than that you know it was uh, easy peasy <laughs> <laughs> yeah cya who are the crazy young artists talk to us talk to us about how you met them mm -hmm. and what are your memories of the crew um cya was started by i think it was started by uh too mad in art and design and it was two mad and days they met there and they made the crew there was another guy uh gene 13 who's from the west upper west side of manhattan in the 80s and i think he was part of the original members so i think it was two mad gene 13 and days were the original members and Days put me down uh, in the crew. And I remember one time we went to Riverside Drive. This was when I was, I was still living on Roswell Island. So it had to be sometime in 79. I have a picture of that piece also that it was in some, some documentary where there is a girl skipping rope. And at the end of the video, you see the, the wall with my crazy piece. Um, we went to Riverside Drive, and I think Too Mad met us there at Cathedral Parkway, 110th Street. And we went to paint this wall, and he there was, I think he did a world. I did this crazy knack piece, probably was my third piece. And Days did a piece. I think the world had a, like a worm coming out of there. Uh, actually, this is the same wall where they did the uh, Star Wars wall. Mm -hmm that uh, I guess it was Zephyr and, and Sharp ended up doing for the uh, for the movie. On that handball, big wall there on Riverside, that was the wall that, part of that wall was where I did my third piece. And uh, my first time meeting Too Mad, and he was a cool cat. Um, I don't even remember if I met Gene 13 back in the day. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I did. But those were the original members. So I was just like, okay, I'm in a crew. I got to put up CYA. So basically CYA was like the first crew I was putting in, uh, putting up. And um, there was a lot of the uh, new member. Another member that went to art and design was Base 2. Uh, Base 2 was uh, also a prolific writer, prolific artist, and uh, also a great DJ. So at the time... Uh, when he found out that I had turntables, uh, he had some other friends that were 
uh, emceeing and became my friends as well, which was uh, Destiny, uh, Base 2's brother Tech, who was also in CYA, and Rip7, who was also part of the Bron original The Bronx Boys, uh, Rocksteady Crew, mm -hmm. um, early B-Boy. And uh, they would come over to my house and practice on my turntables and get, you know, we'd make some tapes and they'd be on the mic. And it was sort of like my apartment in uh, Batanzas was sort of like a, uh, a little hot spot where all writers, you would come and hang out and write in black books or just come over and practice DJing and getting on the mic and, you know, uh, I would say, whatever you do, don't tag the staircase. That lasted for like, not, I don't even think it lasted. It was, forget it. Everybody had to take a tag. It was only in the Potanzas projects where I lived, there was only three, three floors. So there's not much. Go. I was on the second floor. So you're going to, you know, there's not much places you're going to see that you're not going to see. So right. it's. I know the staircase. It's just like, oh, damn, you guys did all that in my staircase? I said, don't hit the staircase. <laughs> but I remember doing, I did a Kev piece right outside my my uh, my window on this brick wall. Me and, and Days did a Days. Uh, I think I started putting up Kev because I saw the guy from uh, CIA was putting up Aaron CIA. So I was just like, let me write Kevin, you know, and try and make a nice script style writing. So I did a couple of, I did a Kev piece on that wall. Um, and your question was about... Uh, about how you met them and how oh, yeah, CYA yeah, that's how I, that's how I met. So basically, Days was showing me how to write, get some letter style, would give me outlines, and that's how my experience was meeting the other guys from C, uh, CYA, mm -hmm. uh, Too Mad, and going piecing with him for that time, and then eventually meeting Base 2 and uh, his brother Tech, and they got down to CYA because they were in art and design. And basically, those are the members that, you know, I would hang around with was basically Days. Uh, Base 2 was, uh, he, he got, he did a bunch of pieces that were really nice. Uh, he did a crush. Well, Case 2 did the crush, and he did a nod, NOD. And then there was a, a, a Delt. Tech and base silver bubble letters that they did on the one tunnel where we had the big picnic in there, and uh, yeah, he did a, a, a bunch of nice pieces. Uh, base too. Okay, can you walk us through the process of doing a piece? Did you plan it, sketch it out uh -huh. in detail? You know, did you do them on your own? Did you collab with other people in your crew? Yeah, so basically everything is like a blueprint. Yeah. Here are the blueprints. You know, I'm getting fed this information. You're going to go peace. You're going to need an outline. And, nah, don't do that. Do this, you know, here. And I'm just like, oh, shit, that's nice. I can do it. I can do it, you know. So basically everything starts with the outline from my experience. There were people that used to go there and just off the top of their head, they would just freestyle it. Like, mm -hmm. Kel... My experience with Kel would be like he would he could make up any outline and make it look hot off the top of his head. So basically, it was you had your blueprint, you had your outline, and you're gonna try and sometimes cats would so, some people would write down the colors on the blueprint. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna use this for the fill in, this for the cloud or whatever. Um, I just went by this is the paint I got, so I'm gonna use what I got get what I want. <laughs> that's right. So that's how it worked out for me. But uh, yeah, it was you had your blueprint, you follow your outline, and you'd be like, okay, let me try and make this happen. Uh, when you're with somebody who's got more experience, they would come over and be like, okay, you need to fix that part, do this, or whatever. Um, and that's basically how it went. Um, I don't think there was ever one time that I went and did something just off of, you know, off of my, since I'm so trained with, okay, you need your outline, this is what you're going to do. You know? mm -hmm. so that's how I, I uh, understood it to be. Like, you need a blueprint, and right. then you're going to, you know, because you can't make a building without a blueprint, right? There you go. <laughs> Racking. Did you rack? And tell us about your first experiences if you did. Racking was like, okay, how do we get the paint? <laughs> and they were like, uh, you don't pay for it. 
You go in the store. You tuck your shirt in to your ja into your pants. You get a nice puffy jacket, and you go in there and you're gonna take the can and just like slide it down through your shirt and then move it towards the back. And you got a bunch of cans back there, and then you're gonna go out and walk out with like you know your jackets open so it's kind of like big. Right. And you're gonna make sure, try and make sure that none of those little marbles in there are rattling right. while you're walking out. Slowly. So you walk out really slow. Wow. That's what uh, racking is. My, I just finished a painting today that is called uh, racking. Okay. Keep on racking. Keep. It, it's an ode to uh, our crumb. Okay. Uh, any any stories about racking that are memorable? You know, close calls. Oh, there was a lot of close calls. Uh, I think one of my, uh, there was a hardware store on like, like 32nd Street or 31st Street and 2nd Avenue that I think one time I went in there and I had a bag and I went in there with a the bag and just filled it up with all this Red Devil and walked out of there like. I hit the jackpot. I was just like, and I was by myself, and I was just like, wow, this is the ultimate, the ultimate uh, racking spot for me. You know, I got all this Red Devil. So, as a young writer, you learn by experience. Uh, I had just moved to the Bronx, and I m made the mistake of all that paint that I took that day. I took it to the bench by myself, which was a bad move. Because next thing you know, I'm sitting there. I'm just like showing off my paint. Look at all the paint I got. I went to this spot, whatever. As I'm sitting there, next thing you know, I'm picking up my glasses, and I got punched, punched in the face. And I don't remember, and my paint is gone. And I'm just like, wow. And I told Daze what happened, and he's like, you never go to, you never bring paint to the bench. And I was just like, you never told me that. Like, where's that in the, you know, there's no uh, handbook of, you know, don't do this, don't do that. So I know it was like a week or so. I ended up going to the bench, looking for the guy. Uh, Crash was with me. My boy CB1, who was like a big dude. He was a base in Tex uh, cousin. And, uh, we had a bat, never caught up to the guy. It was just like, all right, whatever, you know. But uh, that was like the best and worst experience from racking. Right. <laughs> Are there any particular brands of spray paint or marker that you preferred? No, at that time, it was just like you could just get whatever you get. You're going to use, you know, uh, Martin Paints had this wet paint in there. That was a good brand. It had some nice juicy colors like Icy Grape, I think it was. Um so um, that was wet paint was nice. Um, the Martin paint was bad, I would say. It was watery. Uh, the Red Devil was cool. The, the Krylon was, 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 you know, the Rusto was good. Uh, back then, it was sort of like you just use whatever that's available, you know, whatever you can get your hands on. Right. You weren't picky. Yeah. Same with caps. Yeah, yeah the caps, there was only, you only had two caps. Your regular outline cap. And your fat cap, which was uh, probably came from a Niagara. It was your phone. Niagara spray uh, spray can. We go into the stores and we steal the caps off of Niagara starch spray, that would fit on the Krylon on a paint spray paint can and spray out really fat, like or the Jiffy foam caps, which was another cap that was just like you just hear that nice sound, like you know, it, it have a nice. Phil, that was like, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but it was just like invigorating, you know? <laughs> For sure. Talk to us about the characters that you've incorporated into your artwork. Uh, well, lately I've been just doing, you know, I wasn't back then, since I wasn't an artist per se, I was not really drawing people or whatever. So I don't think that I did many characters on the train. Okay. Um, it's only now that I'm just doing a, 
the character I'm doing is basically like a myself. Okay. I'm doing like a bubble-headed character of myself or a caricature of myself with uh, some of it. Sometimes it alternates between uh, I'm on the – looks like a character from The Simpsons to uh, I'm one of the guys from uh, Family Guy. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk to us about any uh, influential fine artists that inspired you in graffiti? Warhol, any people like that? Um, most of the artists that inspired me were from the comic books, you know. Okay. Uh, Bush, Buscema from Marvel Comics, uh, John Byrne, who did the X Men, uh, the guy who did Nick Fury, Agent of Shield, was also a great artist. Um, from the 60s and 70s, uh, forgot his name. He did the, he had the Agent of Shield, uh, had a lot of psychedelic colors in his pieces. Um, you know, Andy Warhol? No. Uh, who inspires me as far as like my artwork now? I don't know. I get a lot of things from, still from, you know, comic book art and just looking at uh, other people's stuff. There's so many different, there's so many people with so many different styles. Like there's the letter style, there's the character style. So, uh, you know, I like the Simpsons characters. So it's simple, mm -hmm. the Bart Simpson, because, you know, Bart wrote graffiti as El Barto. <laughs> right. So that's a cool character. So uh, I have a Simpsons character that looks like myself and my bubblehead character that looks like uh, it's a takeoff of myself. Uh, those are like the only characters that I, I've been really working on. Okay. All right. Great. Can you uh, talk to us about your mentors in graffiti? Um, my mentors in graffiti were probably, first, it was Days, you know. He's the one who mentored me, sort of like I was the apprentice, you know. Okay. Uh, sort of like going back to, if you have the masters back then, they always had the apprentice, right? They had a person they would teach and... Mm -hmm. Show them how this is what you got to use yeah. the paint, and so what's what's uh, what's new is really old. You know, this has been going passed on from generation. It's just like anything else. You learn a craft, and you try and pass it on to the next generation so they could learn it. So basically, he was like my mentor, uh, Dak Two uh, from Roseville Island. He had a like uh, a nice black books. He was a great artist. Um, but there were so many other great graffiti writers. Knock 167 was an incredible style okay. in black books, and his pieces were probably the ones that I first inspired me. His pieces were just, uh, he had this knock piece with the man inside the, the O that you had to really look to see that there's somebody inside the O, and his exploding top to bottom with the O was just like, I want to do something like that, you know, so... I don't know, like writers back then were my inspiration. The Dandy top mm -hmm. to bottoms trains were like something out of a com you know, it was just it was like a comic book come to life, you know? Right. Right. Now, in two thousand four, and I hope this is not a stretch, you won a precedent setting lawsuit against the city of New York for uh painting art and selling clothes without a vendor's license. Yeah. And you won that. Yeah. Can you walk us through how that all started and sure. how this, it ended up? This is also another uh, urban legend because right. a lot of people don't know about this at all. Okay. Just like the whole uh, the Henry story. But so in 82, I quit writing and I just basically went to work. Uh, maybe the only time I came back to writing was Days would say, yo, can you come over and help me gesso some canvas? I'm... Got a lot of stuff. I was like, sure. I came over to him and Crash's studio on 149th Street and uh, jessled up some of his canvases. I saw the mayor sculpture that was there in the corner with the arrows, which I was just like, wow, this is interesting, you know. Uh, and maybe I went to uh, a couple of shows here and there at the time, but I didn't think that I was going to be making artwork on canvas after, mm -hmm. you know. I was just like, I got to get a job, so... 
But the press basically coming back to how did I get in this lawsuit was uh, 9 11 happened. Let's fast forward to 9 11. Okay. Um, I was uh, basically, I, I took, I remember waking up, listening to the radio. I would always listen to uh, the radio and they said, a plane has hit the Twin Towers. So I looked out my window, I saw smoke coming from downtown. And I'm in the Bronx by the Bronx Zoo. So then I turn on the TV and I see the smoke. So after everything that went down that when the buildings fell, uh, I basically don't know what to do. I took a canvas. Me and my roommate, we took a canvas, uh, EQ. We took a big canvas that I had in my house. We took it down to Union Square Park because everybody was sort of like a, a point where everybody would go and where they put the signs up, this person is missing mm -hmm. if you find them. So basically, uh, now the Whole Foods there was closed. It wasn't, it wasn't Whole Foods. That whole building was closed. I took a big canvas there and spray painted the American flag on this big canvas I had in my house. And we took the canvas to the park. We turned it around and we let people write whatever they was feeling on there. So that was like the first time that I basically did something where kind of graffiti, back to graffiti. Mm -hmm. uh, so at that point, I took a jean jacket and I painted the American flag on the back of my jean jacket. So fast forward to, uh, we would be, that canvas, my roommate eventually went over and he, you know, the, uh, the fireman that was on the cover of the post, mm -hmm. and he was on the ax. So my roommate painted over the flag we kept everything on the back and he put the fireman on the canvas and it was much more impactful than the American flag, but it had the American flag incorporated. It was black and silver. So people were still writing on the back of the canvas. So we would haul this canvas from Union Square. Eventually they took everything away from Union Square. We'd haul it down to uh, ground zero and we let people write stuff on the back of it. So then we got the construction workers to donate helmets because we were going to do, somehow they were going to do this. They collected all the artifacts from Union Square Park and they were going to make a show called Missing mm -hmm. about the Union Square, uh, all these uh, items that they got. So my roommate EQ was a volunteer also there. Uh, one time we had Giuliani sign the back of the canvas. I think it was like New Year's or Christmas. Uh, we had uh, the workers donate the helmets for this art show that we were going to be a part of mm -hmm. at the New York Historical Society. Okay. And this was like, oh, I'm in an art show, you know? So I did a helmet that said, uh, it said heroes on the front. And then I just tagged NYPD, FDNY, all the service units around around it and it had a, I would say it wasn't the flag, but it was sort of like the two twin towers going over the top of the helmet, the blue, and it just had the tags around the side. So that was my helmet. And uh, that was my first experience with like, oh, I did a show. Then I'm wearing my jean jacket with the flag. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to get back into doing artwork. So you fast forward to 2002, where I got the uh, graffiti, uh, the mesh caps. I was selling vintage clothes in front of Urban Outfitters. So I had vintage hats. Uh, there was, uh, Pharrell was wearing this yellow hat with the mesh cap. So that's where I got the idea from. I'll sell the vintage clothes and then I'll go get these hats from the wholesale the vintage hats I used to wear back when I was a kid, where we put our tags on there or whatever. Uh, you see the Beastie Boys with some of them tagged out. I think Tracy did those. Uh, I said the Beastie Boys. I'll get the hats. And then I said, I gave the tag away. I just wanted to sell the hats. So I gave the tag away for free. I said, hey, if you want your, uh, your name on the hat, I could do that for you. So boom. 
that's how basically it's me starting painting on hats and I started doing graffiti on the hats from 2002 it was probably like August and then everybody was like you're gonna do mesh caps the summer's over why are you gonna bring out those hats and, you know next thing you know I had only a bunch of hats a dozen or whatever it was sold out after like a day or two I said I'm gonna have to charge including a price on the hats because it was like mm -hmm. So probably like day three or four, uh, I got rid of all the vintage clothes because it was like everybody wanted the hats. So this is where I started bringing back the snapback hat. At the time, maybe they were doing the, uh, besides Pharrell was wearing the yellow one with the brain, which was really popular. Then they came out with those uh, Ed Hardy hats that were the snapbacks. And people would just be like, everybody was wearing fitted hats. Oh, those are two dollar hats. No one's gonna buy that. The vendors were like, "That's a sum. The summer's over. Why are you gonna sell those?" You know. And then after I started doing the writing, they were like, people was taking crowds were starting to gather, and people were asked like, "It's just a fad. It's gonna be gone by next year." I was just like, they said the same thing about tattoos, you know. So uh, from September, from August to Christmas time, I was painting on the hats. I had to get my friend to take the orders. I had to hire another writer because it became too much for one person to wow. do. So you would come down to uh, Bleecker and Broadway and you'd see me there with like a table full of hats. And uh, it was a big, big crowd around this because nobody was doing it. So after the winter, uh, January, February was, that's when the winters were winter. We took a break. And I said, I had two other guys that I was working with. Uh, one guy was an artist. He was a writer. Um, I said to my other friends who I seen, I met Bomb Five, who I had seen mm -hmm. on Broadway. And I was just like, yo. He said, yo, can you come help me? We're going to move this guy or uh, help him move some stuff. And I was like, sure, I'll go with you. This is the first time I'd seen Bomb since back in the, I saw him on Broadway, but I went to one of his shows in the 90s and then, Maybe he came to my house back in the A's with some of the uh, crew from the, the four train base in tech. And see, uh, maybe he was with Rip Seven at the time because he was Rip Seven's original dance partner as well as a B-boy. Um, I said, you should come down to this uh, with me and help me out. We can make some money. There's a lot of money out there to be made when I come back out in the, in the springtime. He's like, really? So I brought Bob Five to doing hats with me. <clears throat> And basically, I what happened was I got arrested. They were like, you need a vendor's license to do artwork on hats. Uh, you can't sell the hats without a vendor's license. So I was just like, man, how's that going to work? So like, that's what I found out when asking other vendors. All the vendors that have a license are just people there whole, taking the money and people who are selling like whatever they're selling jewelry or whatever they they had to hire this vendor and pay him x 20 percent of their 25 percent whatever they negotiated a hundred dollars a day right. and they would be the ones who had to handle the money so i had gotten arrested for writing on the hat hired the vendor and then i told my friend who i went to college with yo your your brothers are uh a veteran, he could get a vendor's license because the vendor's license list is closed. Only if you're a veteran, you could get it. So I had my brother's friend who was here in New York, Gene, and Bomb. And then I had this other guy who was taking the orders, who was um, one of my first, my first partners. And then we had this other guy who was doing the artwork. So then one day, um, I told, you know, we were paying everybody a salary. Uh, Bomb and, and Gene did not like what they were getting out of for the, putting in all their work. So basically, they said, yo, you're going to stick with these guys? It's like this guy thinks he's running, you know, he's the boss of everything. You're the one who started this. We're going to go. I was just like, yo, I'm just going to stick it out and see what happens. So they went down to Soho. Gene and Bomb went down to Soho. So I stayed in front of uh, the Swatch store. And we hired a vendor because um, we had two vent We had two tables. So then one day I went out and uh, 
basically uh, with my with my vendor, and they went out with their vendor, and they said when we came back in the day, we put the money together, and it's like, well, since you came out an hour later, we don't we feel you don't need to get all the money we made prior to that, and I was just like, really? So that's when I knew I had to leave those guys. We were talking about Voltron getting back together again. Yeah, Man. we were talking about uh, how we formed Voltron. Uh, the team, the Manhattan team, which is basically uh, me, Gene, and Bomb Five, and how we got to this court case. What, what? After I got arrested originally, because I, I first came out with just a jean jacket with the American flag on there and a couple of vintage hats. That was the only artwork I had, so that's what I got arrested for. Then, uh, basically, when people saw me painting on the hats. Everybody is, uh, you know, they want to copy me. Mm -hmm. So there was another guy like up the block trying to catch people on Broadway before we, he hit us on, we were on Bleecker Street. He's, a, you know, he's like a couple, of, a block or two in front of us and he was, he got arrested by the cops. And we were telling him like, yo, dude, like, uh, couldn't you go to another spot? Like, I mean, you know. I'm making it out over here. Yeah, like we're the ones who, you know. Go somewhere else. Find another, your own location. We just, you know, this, I used to tell people, go to Soho. Meanwhile, we were in NoHo. We was above, right. we was above uh, with Thousand Street. Street. Right. Uh, Bob and Gene had originally went to Soho. So basically, then the cops were, he had gotten arrested. So they have an organization that represents the vendors. So they wanted to put a lawsuit together so that way artists could, have to not hire a vendor and just have a tax ID and just do art on the hats. So they basically said, we're going to put a class action lawsuit together. And they basically got my deposition and they got this guy's deposition. And this is how, next thing you know, the lawyer calls me up for the vendor's project and he goes, hey, we won the lawsuit. And there's a guy from the New York Times, well, we're going to take some pictures, we want to come down to the uh, office. Right? So I went down to the office, and it was on Park Avenue, because basically they got some big law firm to take the case on the First Amendment rights thing. And um, when I got there, the guy had, there was a table like this, and the guy had all his hats laid out. Now, this is the guy who told him, like, yeah, why don't you go to another, but he's in, the, he's in the lawsuit with me. So I'm like, I'm not going to take a picture in front of this guy's hats. He's like, we can take a picture, but, so... He holds up a, uh, uh, I think he holds up a can, and I'm holding up a marker, and it came out on page one in the New York Times. You know, uh, the lawyer said maybe you get. Uh, we don't know if there's any money. There's no money involved right now, but we're trying to get you a vendor's license so that way you won't be hassled. So basically, it it became kind of like the judge wrote this decision. It was 32 pages, so I got a copy of the decision. It's, like, pretty long, you know. And they were like, oh, this is really big. You know, now we could, other artists were like, we could write on hats or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying to myself, I just don't want to be hassled, you know, basically. I already got rid of the other vendor, and I brought my friend aboard who's a, a veteran, and he's an artist, so he's just like, you know, I know him. And he could he could be you know part of the crew as opposed to a vendor who doesn't do any art or doesn't really contribute. All you do is hand in the money, you know. So that's how the that law became uh, after that. The page one in the New York Times, which was crazy. Um, that picture came out with me and this other guy standing behind me. Uh, what's his name? I forgot his name. Um, but yeah, that's how basically I won the lawsuit, kind of for other artists to paint on, on hats, but it's kind of a gray area. So I got a vendor's license out of it, which is good till forever. Good. Uh, the other guy, he didn't even want the vendor's license. So we didn't get no money out of it. Good. So the cops still harass, doesn't matter, you know. But luckily my partner, he's got a vendor's license anyway. He's an artist. So, yeah, it was kind of a big thing. I think it's, you know, it's been on many, uh, they say it's on many First Amendment law books uh, as a case that they use. Some guy called me up 
from Brooklyn saying that they're going to make a book and it's going to be based on this case. And Landmark the, case. Yeah. So that's how basically that went down. Okay. Yeah. Now the brand, Mad Hatton. Uh-huh. Is that your creation? Talk to yeah, us how that's that came about. There's no uh, brand brand per se, but that's basically the name of the crew. Okay. <laughs> Just like Zoo York was a crew back in the day. Right. Some guys came and made a skateboard crew based on, uh, they made a, a skate company based on the Zoo York crew, which was just a graph crew back in the day. Same type of deal. Manhattan was, uh, an Australian magazine said, hey, what's the name of this company? What's the name of it? I'm like, this is Mad, it's Manhattan. It's a crazy city, you know? So it was M-A-D-H-A-T-N based on, we got Manhattan, mm-hmm. you know? That's basically how the name came about and. People go to my, in, you know, I tell people my Instagram is says Manhattan on there, even though it says Mac 143, but basically that's what they know me as, you know, Manhattan. I had the big, uh, what do you call it, uh, before Facebook, what was the other one? Uh, oh, one uh, of those, MySpace. Like, MySpace page that, you know, we had that up, built up for, for a while, and then, uh, you know, yeah, so that's how the Manhattan crew came about. But, I'll tell you this much. Manhattan crew, we had a Japanese guy named Joe, Osaka Joe, who was a guy who came up to me on the street and was just like, look, my name is Joe, I do graffiti. He pulled out a notebook with like some hand style. He's like, I need a job. I'm like, you're hired. You know? Um, there was another guy from Spain who uh, there was who came through that he says he's an artist and we had him doing hats. I had two people from Mexico who were doing hats with me. So basically, it's kind of like a worldwide crew in a sense. Mm -hmm. We got Mexico, Mm -hmm. we got Spain, we got uh, Japan. Now, my boy from Japan, Osaka Joe, does some really nasty tattoos with the old school way. Right. uh, The bamboo. Yeah, yeah. He does some crazy, crazy tattoos right now. So that's how the Manhattan crew came about. And... We got so many pictures that uh, we're trying to put the first volume together of a book with uh, this documentary we're working on. Okay. Now, throughout the interview, you've mentioned DJing. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about DJ Knack uh-huh. and tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, on Roseburg Island, basically, uh, Dak was from the Bronx. He would bring tapes and play it on his uh, big JVC radio. And we would hear the tapes of the, the rapping going on. We, it was called rapping back then. It wasn't called hip-hop, really. And uh, I was the first one to get turntables on Hillsborough Island. Uh, when we would go to Queensbridge and we'd see the big speaker systems, which was like the Disco Twins. Yeah. And then we would go to the, to the jams in Ravenswood and Astoria Park. It was like, wow, these guys got sound systems and turntables. So basically... Uh, I was, my, my parents somehow got us turntables, probably was like 78, 70, winter of 78, Christmas 78, and I had, uh, it wasn't the Techniques 1200s, I had Sanyo's first, and you couldn't really scratch on those per se, but you could DJ on them, and we do our own jams on Roseville Island. My boys who live right down a couple of doors from me was uh, Grandmaster D., and his brother Grandmaster T, aka Valor, they uh, t- two incredible DJs, you know. So they would come over. I think maybe it was like a year later or so, or less than a year, we got the twelve hundreds because the Sanyos were like they were good for DJing, but you couldn't really scratch on them. Mm-hmm. So we had the twelve hundreds, and my boys used to come over and, and scratch on them, Grandmaster D and Grandmaster T. And they would throw their own jams in the, the, the center, and my parents were just like, you can't bring those turntables over there. Like, they was not letting us take it out the house. So, uh, if there was video, there would be the most incredible video. But Grandmaster D and his brother, Grandmaster T, rest in peace, with Valora Todd Carter, they would have a, first they started out with close and play. Remember the close and play? that like you just put the record, the record bigger than the whole system? Right. They would have two close and plays, at the jam in the free, in the center, and they hook up a speaker system to that, and they would turn one up and turn one down, and they would be scratching on the closing play with no mixer. Wow, it's incredible. 
And then they went to, from that to the one where you put the record on, that whole little system. Right. Where it was like the radio and the record player with the thing on the top. They would put the record on there, and they would have two of those upgrade from the closing plate, just like I went from the Sanyo to the Techniques 1200. It had that, uh, and they would also basically hook that up to the sound system, and they would just like turn they turn one up and turn one down. It was just like the most incredible, and they would scratch on them. You would just be like amazed. And later on, Grandmaster D would eventually become the DJ for Houdini and make hip hop history. You know, wow. so he's a good friend for a long time. And ironically, the first Valor had a hit song that blew up in Australia and. My friend was managing him from the island, and he put the tour together with Phase Two, uh, Valor and Double O, which was the group, and Phase Two and Days were the graffiti writers that went to Australia for that uh, one of these groundbreaking tours. Wow! This is like probably after when I left Roosevelt Island in '79. But DJ Knack was DJing basically for Sweet Sixteens. Uh, when I moved to the Bronx, St. Like Pius High School Jam. I remember I had the whole crowd when, uh, what do you call it, Michael Jackson came out with his album, and I had the whole crowd jumping when I mixed it into uh, Rock With You, uh, Michael Jackson, and then I made the mix, the crowd went crazy, and then I took off the wrong record, and everybody went, oh! Yeah. But yeah, I just started DJing house parties, and Sweet Sixteens, and, and high school jams, and, and engagement parties, so it was really... As far as like DJing to get this level of scratching back and forth was really not necessary. I was more like a party DJ. Mm -hmm. But uh, eventually, my crew, CYA, uh, this guy, Bass 2, uh, his crew had uh, Rip7, Destiny, Tech, uh, and two other guys. One guy was the guy who's the lyricist on the Puerto Rico track. They made a crew called the, uh, the TFF, and we had like five Puerto Rican MCs and two DJs. I was the second DJ, so we had this whole sound system that's all Puerto Rican, and we were like trying to like, you know, come out like uh, the Crash crew and everybody else, Grandmaster Flash and them, but we did a couple of stuff, but it was not it was nothing major, you know, and after that, I was just DJing like, you know, anyone hired me for a, a wedding or an engagement party or, you know, bomb, ba uh Baptism, or whatever it was, you know. So that's basically, I've always had records and always DJed uh, in, in that sense. And basically that's as far as like, as far as the DJ goes, like nothing really, uh, you know, big in any clubs. Right. Uh, I had a party in the tunnel. I had a party where in Club USA, I was the party promoter in the 90s and stuff like that. But I wasn't really trying to DJ. <laughs> I was just trying to do a party. Right. Now, to get to another element of hip-hop, you were talking about early in your oral history about popping and locking. Uh -huh. So you were a breaker, rocker, dancer. Yeah. Talk to us about yeah, B-Boy Knack. Yeah, yeah. B-Boy Knack was sort of like, uh, so, you know, you have your uh, popping and locking was really the electric boogie on the East Coast. We saw it on uh, Soul Train, and we called it electric boogie, you know. Uh, boogie. We didn't know it was called popping and locking. So one day, my cut. We were at a party, and I remember the first time. I mean, I seen it, and then you saw rerun do some locking on uh, I, what's, what's happening. happening. But uh, we saw it in uh, Soul Train, and that's where my cousin picked up some of it. And one day, we was at a party, a house party in Spanish Harlem. It was me, Fable, and my cousin Wiggles, and. He did a slide back. This was before Michael Jackson doing the slide, even though Michael was learning, since he's from the West Coast, he was learning from the lockers. Right. And he was doing his robot. Uh, Miss Wiggles, my cousin, did a slide, and we were just like, what's that? You got to show us that. So basically, from that point, started practicing. Him and Fable were going to art and design together, so they became really, really close. They became more like a team. And yeah, I was there as far as like a bunch of times where we would come out and let's go down to uh, the library and do some, uh, get some money. And we'd go out there and perform and, you know, uh, all this stuff that 
that went down as far as like with his video and you see my cousin popping or whatever. I mean, who knew that there was a camera that was being filmed? <laughs> no one said, hey, let's call it, let's call Kevin. Maybe, uh, you know, I'm sure there was probably someone was there in front of the library and got video of me or whatever. One time we battled the Rock City crew in a uh, B&B disco on 122nd Street. Mm. And it was me, Fable, and, and Wiggles, and uh, Crazy Legs tried to put some breaking into the electric boogie contest. And somehow, some way, since they were popular, they got the uh, the trophy or whatever. And it was, we were like, yo, you still owe us for that. To this day, we're like, you still owe us for that. It was rigged. <laughs> right. So... Being a b-boy, you look like a b-boy. Did you wear b-boy gear? And where did you get your b-boy gear? Yeah, well, it was all about the, you know, style is the number one thing, of course. Right, right. You know, uh, so I was always wearing uh, AJs and overlaps when I went to that one year in Mount St. Michael, which was in 77, probably. And when I got to Rosewell Island, it was all about the, uh, the plaid, uh, wide leg slacks and you know sneakers and members only you know it was a, the style was always the fro whatever when I got to the Bronx I had the sheepskin jacket uh, and you know everybody was coming down with the uh, style was just evolving you know everybody was just making the best of what they had putting the permanent creases in the leaves yeah. and uh, sneakers were a big thing you know, I had in Richmond, Julie Richmond High School, which I went to, I had uh, Nike, everybody was rocking the Cortez. So my, I was just like, I want to be different. I would look for Nikes that no one had. Burgundy color with the cream color line, this uh, Mets blue color with the yellow line, and always trying to be different with the fat laces. And then one day Fable came out with the uh, the fat laces of all fat laces where he went and he got the, uh, what was it, the elastic for uh, for sewing. When you put it in your, in your pants, he got the elastic for sewing. He put it on his Converse. And he had the ultimate fat laces and it could never be beat. It never could be topped. Okay. I think Henry Chalfant's got a picture of him with the uh, the lead jeans with the graffiti piece down his leg. But... Uh, yeah, Fable had some crazy style. So basically, we were just uh, rocking style from from the get-go, you know? B-Boy Knack was always uh, trying to look fresh, you know? And then I got a job in Dr. J's Army Navy on 125th Street mm -hmm. in the 80s. And I saw the first the first uh, Air Jordans. They were, I think, they were $69.99. So the box, it was the ugliest, shitty sneaker I've ever seen. <laughs> Cause I at the time I was a big Knicks fan and I was just like black and red, ugh, mm -hmm. get those Bulls colors out of here. So I would never, to this day, I never owned a pair of Jordan sneakers. But uh, who knew you had to keep one box and put them on the side? You know? <laughs> right, right. Steve yeah. Right. So we we had starter jackets to Dr. <coughs> J's, sheepskin coats to Dr. J's, the BVDs, the Lees. So I was selling all that stuff and plus. Yeah, I could rock that stuff as well. You know, the uh, it wasn't the uh, the there was the Tiger shirts at the time. Yeah, which we call right, the Latiga shirts. Yeah. I remember that. Yep. So, what does graffiti mean to you, and how has your understanding of graffiti changed over time? Well, right now, graffiti is like a big. It's it's evolved like people call it street art these days. Uh, some graffiti writers don't want to be known as street artists. Uh, even though we painted the wall back in the day, we were really street artists, um, and that's what we were. But uh, everyone's got the whole graffiti's got a big. Uh, some people don't want to use that term to this day, also because they don't want to be associated with uh, how the media gave us a label as graffiti artists. And when amongst ourselves, we'd be like meeting at the bench, and we'd go meet other writers, and where do you find writers? It wasn't like, where would you find graffiti writers, you know? It was just like, where would you find writers? Got it. And, uh, yeah, graffiti is a, it's a big it's a big thing. Um, where is it going? I don't know. I know that uh, 
I'm just trying to make bigger and better murals and uh, canvases and just evolve to whatever it is with uh, some something to do with um, you know that's colorful that people would want to either hang on their walls or have a wall painted or uh, you know it's it's gotten to where you can make a toy it's gotten to all kinds of things you know it's really evolved into just like the computer it's just like the first computer you know and Windows it's just like boom. Now you got all these programs. Now you got all these apps. You know, now you don't need cable. You can just have an app to watch TV. You know, mm -hmm. sort of like graffiti is the same thing. You know, definitely, definitely. What does the Bronx mean to you? The Bronx is where it all started. The Bronx is like it's a home of creativity. You know, that's where uh, so many things. I'm not a Yankee fan, but I respect the Yankees, and I do like watching. Aaron Judge and greatness uh, since I grew up a Mets fan only because the big brother said I'm a Yankee fan and I said okay I'll do the opposite I'm a, Yan I'm a Mets fan <laughs> but uh, I, I love the whole history about the Yankees so the Bronx is sort of like it's, it's got great history um, so so many great people came out of the Bronx and uh, did their best and created something like Ralph Lifshitz Ralph Lauren did the clothing and there's uh, the Yan great Yankee teams, and there's so many artists, you know, that came out of the Bronx that uh, I just want to be a part of that whole, uh, hopefully I am a part of that whole nucleus, you know, I am a part of that whole nucleus that he started, uh, he was a DJ, he did his graffiti thing, and he evolved into some canvases now, and he did, he started those uh, graffiti on the hats in Soho. The Times Square, and now here we are in 2023, where, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a book and a documentary soon. There you go. There you go. Now, before we close out all the interviews, mm -hmm. we like to ask all the artists if you can write your tag for us uh -huh. so that we can add to the uh, oral history archival record. Sure, sure. That would be yeah. great. Here you go. Yeah. Don't want to deny you colors. So it should just be my tag or yeah. the page or do whatever I want on the page? Do whatever you want on that page. So this is going to be on the YouTube, and then it's going to be uh, archived? Yeah, it'll be on the Bronx County Historical Society okay. online webpage. Mm -hmm. So when people come to look at our uh, all of our oral histories from our different projects, they'll be able to pull it up there. Researchers, students, regular Bronx sites. So I'm doing this documentary. It's just I have thousands of pictures of from 2002 being out on the street of all our customers and all the custom clothing we did. Right. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to recreate, get some interviews with some of the customers and hopefully some of the celebrities that came through that. Uh, 
Little Mama was one of our customers back in the day, and okay. she got some vintage clothing from us for her music video. Nice. We started selling the gold world chains that you saw around the city, like back in the early 2000s. Right. Mid- so yeah, basically we brought back, uh, we went from switching from the mesh caps to the snapback vintage hats, and uh, got arrested for that too, even after the lawsuit. Wow. So that's what's going to be in the documentary. And there's a big, uh, there's a big connection to phase two in the documentary at the end, also, because it's like six degrees of separation. Mm-hmm. We're all connected. Today's what the eleventh. Tags and throw ups on that page. Yeah, the whole deal. <laughs> the whole the, thing. I gave you the NAC tag, the NAC, the NAK, the first tag. And this tag is uh, also. Sweet. Just, Any Kevs up there? <laughs> no. NAC Want to show it? Three. There you go. Beautiful work. Thank you so much, NAC143. We appreciate your time. And thank you for coming. Peace.